Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Karen Malpita, and I wrote and directed the play Prophecy. And that's, and that's not why I said that, just so you would know who I was. Because it's really my profound pleasure to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky, author, teacher, linguist, preeminent intellectual and moral voice of our time. Um, Noam Chomsky knows more about the causes and effects of American imperialism than any other person alive, and certainly far more than anyone in the government. Uh, so right now, when we need someone capable of cutting through the cant and speaking truth to power, we are graced with his fierce and rigorous and gentle voice. And I particularly want to thank Noam for his generosity in supporting Theater 3 Collaborative, a little tiny theater trying to put on a play about the effects of war that no established theater in this country dared to produce. When I wrote Noam the story of how we realized that we would have to do the play ourselves, he answered, why am I not surprised? Uh, and he agreed to help. It's always been my dream that the theater become again a vital part of the intellectual life of its time. And it's a very great honor for the theater as a whole to welcome Noam Chomsky to the stage tonight. Does this, uh, does this work? Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we moved to a different auditorium, frankly. <laughs> I thought I could shake off a little bit the uh, emotions and the memories that were brought up by the performance a little bit, not too much. Uh, one thing that uh, couldn't help coming to my mind as I was watching it, that uh, I don't want to spend time on personal things, but I've had about 75 years of consciousness of the outside world and I don't think there's been a moment when, at least in the background and often obsessively in the foreground, there was the thought that we've got to do something to stop this horrific war. Uh, too many of them to mention. Uh, and they're going to go on. And uh, they're going to go on. We can see them developing right in front of our eyes unless we do something about it. I'll say a couple of words about that and then <clears throat> turn to you and see what's on your minds. Uh, I, I just happen to have come back from Lebanon a couple of days ago. It's, uh, I was there four years, exactly four years ago with my wife. We uh, traveled through southern Lebanon, met lots of people. We were graciously welcomed. And, Homes. We uh, gave, I gave talks, met lots, of did all, you know, saw the country. It was a moment of real hope. It's had a terrible history, but that was a moment of great hopefulness uh, and aspiration for a better future. A couple of weeks after we left, uh, the place was leveled. Uh, that was the uh, uh, U.S.-Israeli war. It's a, they operate in tandem. It was a U.S.-Israeli war which essentially leveled the southern part of the country. Uh, this time, of course, I went back to try to see the places where we had been, where uh, the places where we had been welcomed, the people we had met, some of them now murdered. Uh, places like uh, Nadahia in southern, in southern South Beirut, which was literally leveled. Uh, that's the famous Dachya doctrine that an Israeli general proposed for uh, Gaza a couple of years later. Uh, it, it, a lot of it's been rebuilt, amazingly rebuilt. Uh, there's still a spirit of uh, courage and determination, but my sense is of uh, more grimness than there was before because of an expectation that it's going to happen again, and it might. I spoke to knowledge, quite, I don't want to mention any names, but very knowledgeable journalists who've been in the region for decades and are convinced that uh, there's a, uh, an uh, there's a Israel Hezbollah war coming maybe soon. And uh, 
and that and this it'll presumably be part of an Israeli attack on Iran if it happens. Uh, if it does, this time it'll be an air an all out air war which will probably destroy all of Lebanon and uh, Hezbollah seems to believe and those who know about it seem to take them seriously uh, they could that they have now the capacity to uh, devastate a good part of Israel so maybe they'll succeed in destroying each other uh, or something like it and it could be imminent and it could be part of a much worse war uh, uh, the, uh, involving Iran or even beyond uh, how imminent it is we don't really know so for example Iran has announced, as you may have seen, that they would send uh, ships to Gaza to join the efforts to break the blockade. If that happens, you know, it's finished. It might turn into a nuclear war which could spread without limits. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, we have a president named Barack Obama. If you take a look at his uh, website, I don't know if it's still there, but the website that he had, he put up uh, in his primary campaign uh, explaining his policies and goals and so on. Uh, there's uh, actually the word Lebanon is mentioned once. Uh, it's full of uh, effusive love for Israel, of course, but the word Lebanon is mentioned once. Uh, namely, uh, he took pride in the fact that as a senator, one of the few things that he did was to co-sponsor a, a resolution in uh, June 2006, uh, a resolution which uh, uh, insisted that nothing be done to prevent Israel from achieving its maximal goals in its invasion of Lebanon, uh, and that uh, Iran and Syria should be punished for helping uh, uh, defend Lebanon from its attackers. Uh, the uh, I gave, of course, talks in Lebanon. One of them was on May 25th. Uh, May 25th, I didn't know this, is uh, happens to be uh, uh, Lebanon Liberation Day. It's the one national holiday in Lebanon. Schools are closed, businesses closed. Uh, what's it about? Well, it's about the fact that in the year 2000, uh, the guerrillas, Hezbollah primarily, had finally succeeded in driving Israel out of southern Lebanon, uh, where it had been holding territory for uh, 22 years in violation of Security Council orders, with plenty of atrocities and massacres, actually included a number of invasions, including all of the uh, uh, Israeli figures who are regarded as uh, uh, heroic doves, uh, Shimon Peres, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, and others. But they finally left and uh, withdrew in uh, uh, the year 2000. So this happened to be the 10th anniversary of, of the National Holiday Liberation Day. If you read the uh, press coverage in Israel uh, uh, today, it's, it's full of articles by military figures, uh, other officials, Ephraim Snem, Moshe Arendt, uh, describing how they made a mistake by withdrawing from Lebanon because uh, now Hezbollah is, uh, not, they don't talk about Hezbollah, now Iran uh, is able to renew its aggression against Israel in southern Lebanon. In other words, what they were doing in southern Lebanon, driving a uh, guerrilla war against Israel, was aggression against Israel by Iran. And that's accepted in the United States. Uh, you all know about the flotilla. Uh, you know that uh, Israeli helicopters uh, 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 flew over the boats, uh, let commandos down from them. Uh, Where did the helicopters come from? Well, from your pockets, if you're, pay if you're taxpayers. Israel doesn't manufacture helicopters. We give them the helicopters with the purpose of carrying out war crimes. And that's not a joke. Uh, in just to give one example, in the first month of the, in September uh, 2000, uh, just about the time that Israel withdrew from Lebanon finally, 
In September 2000, the, uh, the second intifada broke out. The first month of it was September. It was right after Ariel Sharon had uh, uh, gone on that famous uh, visit to the uh, uh, region of the Temple Mount. Uh, very provocative, and then the next day, uh, Ehud Barak sent a big military force which killed a lot of people. Uh, then it broke out. Uh, the, in that first month, September, there were uh, 70 Palestinians killed and uh, four Israeli soldiers, uh, the, the usual ratio. Uh, if you go back to the press reports, you'll find that uh, the, uh, Israel, Israel was using helicopters, meaning American helicopters, uh, to attack uh, uh, civilian targets like apartment complexes, killing dozens of people. It was reported. Uh, what was not reported, however, and to this day is barely known, is that just as those reports were coming out about U.S. helicopters being used to attack civilian complexes, uh, Bill Clinton uh, made, sent, made a deal to send the biggest uh, a, a consignment of helicopters to Israel ever, or, or at least in a decade, uh, Black Hawk helico helicopters and uh, spare parts for Apache helicopters, the attack helicopters. That came out right at the time that uh, the news reports were coming out about using them to attack civilian complexes. It wasn't a secret. You could read it in the Israeli press, you could read it in uh, the military journals, James Defense Weekly, you could read it in the European press. Uh, Amnesty International had a report about it, condemning it. Not a word in the U.S. press, actually one word. One small newspaper in Virginia had a, a reference to it. Uh, it wasn't that it wasn't known, it was all over the wire services. Of editors were in fact approached asking them why, why you don't run it. Well, you know, that's uh, the kind of contribution that we make to these atrocities. Uh, and we'll continue to. Uh, Obama's one of the more extreme in this respect, as in the example I just mentioned. Well, if that comes, that's one major war that may come pretty soon, maybe is likely to come. It's not the only one. Uh, the one that's more likely, in fact, is imminent any day now, is an attack on uh, Kandahar in Afghanistan, second largest city in Afghanistan. It's been announced, it's not a secret, that the next major uh, attack in Afghanistan is going to be on Kandahar. Well, the U.S. Army has published, uh, taken polls and published them, so you can read them in the American press, of opinion in Kandahar. That's about 95% opposed to a military action. Uh, uh, 19 to one by the tribal elders who've met, uh, <coughs> apart from coal, the same percentage say, we don't want uh, military action against our Afghan brothers, referring to the Taliban. Okay, that's the next one that's coming. You can guess what that's gonna look like. Uh, the last uh, attack, were widely reported, Harold of his great victory was uh, an attack on Marja. Marja is a town, small town <coughs> in the Helmand province where most of the uh, insurgency is in the Pashtun areas. Uh, and Marja was finally con uh, conquered after a couple of days of pretty bitter fighting. Uh, as you may have seen, a few days after that, the uh, commander, I think a lieutenant general or something, forgot his name, uh, had an interview in the press in which he said, uh, we've got to revise our notion of enemy. He said, we were thinking we were going to drive the enemy out of uh, Marja, but now we understand that the people of Marja support the enemy. So we can't, we've got to re recalibrate and think some other way of talking about who the enemy is. This is very reminiscent of uh, earlier uh, counterinsurgency wars, in fact, you could have read the same in Pravda in the 1980s, and you could have read the same in the United States in the 1960s, where it was written. So, for example, in, uh, must have been 1965, the leading U.S. government scholar, Douglas Pike, wrote a book about the Viet Cong, 
the Viet Cong is a derogatory term invented by U.S. propaganda for the National Liberation Front, the Southern Resistance. Uh, and he uh, described how difficult the U.S. goals are going to be in uh, uh, South Vietnam. He said the problem we face is that uh, uh, the Viet Cong uh, are, ma are the only mass-based political force in South Vietnam. And to try to confront them, say, in, by political means, would be like a minnow confronting a whale, uh, our clients being the minnow, them being the whale. So therefore, the only thing we can do is to re reconstru reconstruct the war so that it's not the kind they want, a political war, but it's the kind we're good at, a military war. So we prefer our comparative advantage, which is violence. And we have to do that because there's no other way to for a minnow to deal with a whale. And in fact, that's uh, the main principle of the famous uh, coin, as it's now called, counterinsurgency doctrine, which is, you know, the wonderful new uh, uh, theory that we're supposed to be dedicated to. And yeah, if you're fighting wars in uh, other people's countries, you're constantly faced with that. It's not, it's not the United States that invented it, or the Russians, or the British could have told you the same thing, the French, uh, the Germans, in fact, as far back as you go, uh, the Romans, for, uh, the Greeks. Well, that's the prospect we're looking for at. And uh, for whatever years I have left, I don't expect them to be different from the past 75 uh, of consciousness, uh, uh, unless something very significant happens here, at least a willingness to face the reality of these uh, of these uh, actions. I'll stop there and turn to you. So if you would like to ask a question or say something, raise your hand and you'll get a microphone. Do you think that if Barack Obama is erected, um, uh, <laughs> elected for a second term, you will see him go more to the right? It would be more to the right? Yes. Hard to know. I'm going to take, say, George Bush. Uh, Bush's second term was considerably more centrist than his first term. First term was uh, you know, abrasive, aggressive, uh, uh, brazen. I mean, he uh, basically, literally, he, he and Colin Powell and the rest uh, told Europeans, literally, you either do what we say or you're irrelevant. Uh, and uh, we don't care about you. We make history was one of their famous words. Uh, we don't care. You, you guys, the reporters, you can report history, but we make it. Uh, and they went ahead and made it, uh, like in Iraq, for example. Uh, the, that uh, term dropped U.S. prestige to its lowest point in history. The U.S. became one of the most hated countries in the world and feared countries in the world. And it led to quite considerable internal criticism right within the establishment. Well, the second Bush term moved, was more moderate, moved more toward the center. They kicked out some of the most uh, outlandish figures, uh, Rumsfeld, uh, Wolfowitz, uh, a couple others. Couldn't get rid of Dick Cheney because he basically was the administration. But the others, they, a lot of the others went. And it was uh, more of a familiar, uh, kind of what we call centrist administration. And Obama's pretty much following uh, the uh, policies of the second Bush administration. What he would do in the next term, if he has another term, I don't know how to predict, depends on the world situation. You just can't tell. I mean, take, say, Kennedy. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, propaganda is what it amounts to about how if Kennedy had, been, had not been assassinated, all kind of wonderful things would have happened. He was planning this, that, and the other. He was going to get us out of Vietnam. He was going to make peace in the world, and so on. Uh, the evidence for that is zero. I mean, on, on Vietnam, for example, there's a massive evidence. And what it shows is he was sort of the t toward the hawkish end of the administration. Um, he was willing to tolerate McNamara's proposals for uh, slow withdrawal from Vietnam, but always with a qualification. After victory, never departed from that. So, yeah, 
after victory. And in fact, uh, the people in his administration, like McNamara, who were the most committed to withdrawal, we know what they did when the situation changed. After there was a kind of period of uh, optimism about victory in 1963, by 1964 it was clear that that was a fantasy. So then, the war, then we get uh, the spike and the policies that went along with it. And I don't see the slightest reason to doubt that Kennedy would have done the same thing. And uh, you know, uh, 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 political leaders operate within a pretty narrow framework, which is set by external factors, power systems of various kinds, mostly domestic uh, concentration of economic power. And uh, they, there's a difference between them. They're not identical, but uh, I don't think that these differences are very predictable. So for example, in many ways, Richard Nixon was the last liberal president. <laughs> That's literally true if you look at his policies. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask you uh, what you see, uh, whether the, the, um, the financial crisis, crisis has, has had any effect on the level of aggressiveness of the Obama administration. Well, it's going to have to have some effect. Uh, look at the famous def We're now, you know, the current propaganda is we have to be obsessed with the deficit. Okay, that's coming from people like the Peter Peterson Institute and others who are... <coughs> you know, just uh, dying to get rid of Social Security and other benefits that they hate. Uh, so we have to concentrate on the deficit. Actually, it's a pretty dumb idea. You should have a deficit during a recession. You should have a bigger deficit to stimulate growth and so on, but put that aside. What's the deficit? Take a look at it. About half the deficit is military spending, uh, which is going up under Obama. In fact, it's the most military spending of any president in his first term, not relative to GDP, but absolutely. Well, that's roughly half the deficit. Uh, so if, if anyone's going to deal with the deficit, they're going to have to do something with that. And of course, that would mean uh, cutting back on uh, uh, adventurism overseas. The United States is spending approximately as much on the military as the rest of the world combined. And it's technologically far more advanced and going into areas that other countries can't even dream about and in fact they're trying to prevent like space, you know, uh, war uh, using space for military purposes. Uh, and there's all kind of other uh, grotesque ideas on the drawing board. Like take drones, which are the exciting new technology. Uh, there are now plans for uh, developing drones with nanotechnology, which allows a lot, theoretically, a lot more flexibility. And having them range from, you know, massive drones, which can carry out vast destruction, to uh, uh, drones for targeted assassinations, which have just been condemned by Philip Alston, who's one of the leading specialists on international human rights, uh, down to drones which can get into your living room uh, and kill particular tiny drones that'll uh, be able to penetrate small living spaces and kill people suspected of this, that, or the other thing. Well, you know, all of this is extremely expensive. And that's plus the 800 or so military bases around the world. And the Obama administration is very much committed to those. I mean, they practically overthrew the government of Japan just recently. It's a big country uh, because the, the prime minister of Japan had been elected on a campaign promise to uh, Hatayama to uh, close down the uh, military base in Okinawa. Uh, the people of Okinawa have been struggling to get that base out of there for decades. And the Japanese government finally agreed to try to do it. But the Obama administration put its foot down with a major power play and uh, Hatayama had to resign. You know, that's uh, an indication of how power works and what the plans are. So yeah, if, there, if there's going to be any effort to deal with the, uh, the growing deficit, a serious effort, uh, that's what it'll have to concentrate on. Now, it's not going to. Uh, Obama has a commission, as you know, that's supposed to deal with the deficit. But there's every likelihood that that commission, if you just took a look at the way it's constituted, is going to go after benefits like Social Security, which isn't an economic problem at all, but is hated by elites. They've been trying to get rid of it for years. 
although it's pretty good shape uh, fiscally. So they're going to go after that, they're going to have to go after Medicare benefits and so on, but uh, nobody's talking about doing anything about the military, which keeps expanding. But yeah, that's going to be a constraint at some point. You know, you can't go on like that forever. Actually, the other half of the deficit is mostly medical expenses due to the completely dysfunctional U.S. medical system, which has not been improved in its most dysfunctional aspect by Obama's health care reform. I mean, health care reform had a few good things in it, but uh, it didn't touch the main part, which is the incredible expense of the system. Now, it's about twice the per capita expense of uh, other of comparable countries, and outcomes are down toward the bottom. So, for example, uh, maternal Amnesty International just put out a report on maternal deaths, deaths during childbirth. The United States is worse than Greece. You know, I mean, it, it's uh, despite twice as high per capita expenses as anybody. Uh, one of the these studies, global studies. It, compared many countries, among them Cuba and the United States. Cuba has approximately the same health outcomes as the United States, at 5% of the expense per capita. Well, none of this is touched in Obama's health care reform. Um, and we have, this is the only country in the world, where, as far as I know, where uh, the government is barred by law from uh, negotiating drug prices. They can do it in the Veterans Administration, so their prices are sort of reasonable, but they, they, Medicare can't do it. Uh, so, of course, drug prices are, you know, two or three times as high as anywhere else. Uh, Obama insisted on that. He made a promise to the drug companies that that wouldn't be touched over the objection of 85% of the population, according to polls at the time. All right, that's not touched. The private, privatized and virtually unregulated insurance basis for the system is extremely expensive, and that's not touched. In fact, as you know, Obama killed even the public option uh, over the objection of probably two-thirds of the population. And so these things are just, you know, that's holy territory. Financial institutions are far too powerful uh, to, uh, uh, in dom dominating the government for there to be any real progress on this unless we move towards a functioning democracy. But, but what the point you make is correct. There's, there is a conflict coming up between uh, a financial crisis, which is going to stay, it's not going away. Uh, unemployment's going to be very high for a while. It's not just a financial crisis, it's a general economic crisis. Uh, unemployment is extremely high, no ch indication that it's going to reduce. Uh, in fact, you know, the economists are now recalculating what's called the natural rate of unemployment. So, uh, and, and they're calculating it up. Some are getting it as high as 7.5%. That means that should be normal unemployment. Uh, not too far from the official figures now. In the manufacturing industry, uh, uh, where the likelihood that jo jobs will come back is very slight, unemployment is at about the level of the Great Depression. So these problems are there, and uh, how that's going to be combined with uh, a, global war a global warfare commitment, expanding massive global warfare commitment, that's not obvious. Yeah. I would, you mentioned a very critical example of how the media largely fails to report on things like this. And I would like to ask you that to what extent you think the internet might change that picture for the better, but more importantly, as we just saw this great theater piece, to what extent you think art in general and theater in particular is doing a better job in reflecting critically on these things? Well, what you just saw is a good example. Uh, how effective it is, I mean, a lot of people are putting out a lot of energy and effort into it. Uh, it hasn't been enough to turn things around. As I said, I've been through uh, 75 conscious years and 
has there have been games, you know, things have been done, but not enough to uh, end the fact that we're in a permanent that there are, there's a permanent state of war going on in the world. Sometimes it's not us. Sometimes we're not directly involved. And so, for example, right now the uh, probably the worst atrocities in the world are in Eastern Congo, and nobody talks about that. We talk about Darfur, which is bad enough, because there you can blame it on Arabs. Uh, so, okay, that's a good topic. Uh, Eastern Congo, unfortunately, you have to blame it on Rwanda, a U.S. ally, uh, and on multinational corporations, uh, which are hiring mil the militias that are destroying the place in order uh, so that people like us can have uh, a coltane in our cell phones and other such things. So we don't talk about those, though maybe five million people have been killed there in the last couple of years. And there are things like that happening all over, and all too often we're directly involved. So has it been enough? Well, obviously not. Uh, has it been something? Yes, it certainly has. For example, the uh, Iraq War, horrible as it was, was nothing like the Vietnam War. Uh, not even close. And a large part of the reason was there's just too much internal resistance here. In the case of the Vietnam War, there was almost no internal resistance. And if you think about it, there was finally a, a strong anti-war movement, which had an effect, but those of you who are old enough to remember will remember that it was uh, 1967, 1968. That's after f about five years of war. The first several years of war, no protest. In fact, when there were protests, they, they were broken up violently with the applause of the liberal press. Uh, so that didn't happen in Iraq, and it, uh, had, it had some kind of an effect in uh, keeping, it, uh, keeping it down. Now, there's, it's commonly point, claimed that you know, there's a lot of wonderment about why there's so much less protest against Iraq as compared with Vietnam. Just think back. At the time when the Iraq Vietnam War was anything like the Iraq War, there was no protest at all to speak of. Uh, much higher protest in the case of Iraq. And it uh, it's, you know, has a kind of an effect, uh, obviously not enough of an effect, uh, but something. So yeah, it has to, more has to be done, clearly. In the wake of the Free Gaza Flotilla and the attack on it, the, um, certainly the Israeli government and the neocons here have um, made the interesting twist of uh, demonizing Turkey, who I thought um, the U.S. was relying upon as an ally to help them ex extricate themselves from Iraq. So have you any thoughts as to uh, where that's taking us? Well, first of all, just one slight correction. It's not the neocons here. Uh, the other day, I, I occasionally torture myself by listening to NPR. When I was driving home. That's not the neocons. That's the other end. I was driving home, I guess it must have been Friday, and uh, was listening to the news. And, uh, you know, they're all things considered. They have two commentators, for those of you who listen. Uh, David Brooks on the right and E.J. Dion on what's called the left, and that's the spectrum. And so that was, they came up with question, one of the questions, I think it was Friday, was uh, uh, what do you think about the uh, uh, flotilla? And the two of them outdid each other, in, uh, tried to outdo each other in uh, vociferous uh, support for the Israeli action, and how it was completely moral and just justified, maybe not carried out very well, but certainly correct. If you look through op-eds, it's the same. Uh, New York Times has had a bunch of op-eds about it. Either they come from uh, 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 spokespeople for the Israeli government, government officials even, or, or else others supportive of them. Uh, the United States is kind of off the global spectrum on this. I don't, you know, I don't read the whole world press, but from what I've seen in the world press, it's very, angry about this. Even the, you know, the kind of mainstream business press like the London Financial Times, but not here. And it's not the neocons. Unfortunately, it's across the board. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, 
you're quite right about the uh, going after Turkey. I mean, the thing has been reconstructed as if in accord with Israeli government propaganda that uh, the real issue is that uh, Turkish terrorists were attacking Israel. That's kind of like what I quoted uh, from the Israeli press about uh, how Iran is, is carrying out aggression against Israel in southern Lebanon. Yeah. Or for that matter, Vietnam. Take Vietnam, it's an interesting case. In the early 60s, when it was the liberal Democrats, you know, Kennedy administration, uh, the line was that uh, the United States is facing internal aggression in South Vietnam. That was Adlai Stevenson, the liberal hero, uh, speaking at the UN. He says, we're facing internal aggression in South Vietnam. Uh, Kennedy called it an assault from within. That's what we're facing in South Vietnam. And, and that's a very, you know, it's a very typical component of imperial ideology. We own the world. So wherever we get attacked, and for Israel the same thing, and there are smaller domains, somebody's carrying out aggression against us, even if we're invading their country. And that's happening right at this moment, not just in the case of Turkey, in a much bigger case. Uh, you all know that uh, the, ma the main policy, foreign policy problem that the Obama administration is facing, according to the you know, analysts and commentators, is Iran the threat of Iran. Well, exactly what is the threat of Iran? Uh, we have an authoritative answer to that. Uh, there was just a study that came out, it's called the Global uh, Military Balance 2010, it comes out every year by a, the Institute of Strategic Studies, I think it's called, a, an institute that's basically part of the US government. They come out with a, an analysis of the global military situation. So, of course, they have a section on Iran, and they discuss the threat of Iran. Uh, what's the threat of Iran? Well, it turns out it's not a military threat. Uh, they point out that uh, Iran has, uh, uh, its military expenditures are among the lowest in the region, and, you know, a minuscule fraction of U.S. expenditures. Uh, furthermore, Iranian military doctrine, they point out, uh, is designed to uh, deter invasions, so to try to hold back aggression long enough so that it can move to diplomacy. That's their military doctrine. They say if they're developing nuclear weapons, it would be as a deterrent against military attack. So, so what's the threat exactly, this huge threat that we have to face? Well, it turns out it's a political threat, the usual kind. The threat is that Iran is what's called destabilizing its neighbors. How is it destabilizing them? By trying to increase its influence. It's trying to increase its influence in the countries that are its neighbors. And that's aggression because we own those countries. When we invade them, that's not destabilization. That's imposing, bringing about stability. Just read the reports. We're working to bring about stability in the countries surrounding Iran, and they're destabilizing them by trying to extend their political influence. So they're a real threat. Uh, they're also, well, the other threat is supporting terror. Uh, what is terror? The terror is Hezbollah and Hamas. Well, you know, whatever you think about Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, it's pretty hard to call what they're doing terror. Hezbollah is a Lebanese organization. Uh, it's now being charged with developing, uh, obtaining weaponry to enable it to deter an Israeli invasion, U.S.-backed Israeli invasion, the kind Obama loves, as he told us on his website. That's terror. Uh, Hamas is uh, uh, trying to protect... Uh, uh, Hamas took power in Gaza in a, an election. They were freely elected. It's the only free election in the Arab world, and they happened to win it. And as soon as they won the election, the U.S. and Israel immediately, you know, within days, stepped up an attack on the Palestinian population to punish them for voting the wrong way in a free election. And that was the first act of terror. The next major act of terror was uh, 
uh, that, that was January 2006, was in June 2007 uh, when they took power in, uh, in uh, uh, Gaza, uh, eliminating Fatah, you know, the Palestinian Authority forces. That's the way it's described. But if you look closely, that's not exactly what happened. What happened is that the U.S. and Israel, with the help of the Palestinian Authority, tried to carry out a military coup to overthrow the elected government. And they beat back the military coup. And that's when they took power. That's when the siege really stepped up. Uh, that's a U.S.-Israeli siege, of course. Uh, well, you know, they're not a, I mean, I don't like them, frankly, and they do a lot of brutal and ugly things, uh, but it's pretty hard to call that Iranian terror. You know? But that's the threat of Iran, uh, supporting terror and uh, destabilization. Well, you know, if you own the world, that's natural. So in South Vietnam, we faced internal aggression, assault from within. And in the case you mentioned, uh, when uh, Israel, with U.S. support and U.S. equipment, uh, attacks a boat in international waters, killing people, a major crime, uh, it's the fault of the people on the boat. You know, they're the ones carrying out the terrorism, Turkey in this case. And it's a tricky case, as you mentioned, because Turkey is a major ally. And how they're going to finesse this is not very clear. You know? it's, it's, I mean, from Israel's point of view, apart from the criminality, it's sheer insanity. I mean, Turkey is their only regional ally and a close ally. It's been the second closest ally after the United States uh, since, about, since the 1950s. And they, you know, they, uh, they use Eastern Turkey for military exercises. <coughs> There's military bases there. They're a major uh, uh, military supplier to Turkey and there are plenty of uh, relations in the other direction too. And to alienate their one ally by an act like, by a criminal act like this is profound irrationality and one of many extremely irrational acts that they're carrying out in the last couple of years, which is pretty ominous because it's a it's a powerful state, and when it's overcome by paranoia and uh, uh, irrationality and hysteria, there could be real dangers. I, I wanted to ask a question uh, about a totally different area, which is on our the the environment. The environment, because of the not only the oil that is leaking from the British Petroleum explosion but the methane that is being released, and the methane is the worst heat-trapping gas that there is. Do you think that people are gonna to start to wake up to how fragile our planet is and that we can't sustain wars? In, in Pakistan last week, they had the highest temperatures they've ever had, 128 degrees, you know. So it, do you think this is gonna, there'll be something good coming out of it. Last year, as you probably read, was the warmest year on record. Uh, the, what's going on in the Gulf is horrible enough, but it's worth noting a real racist element in our concern about that. I mean, it's, it's a fraction of what's happened in the Niger Delta, for example, where the huge oil spills going on all the time. Uh, causing enormous damage, killing all sorts of people, but you know, that's black Africa, so who cares? I mean, it's not as serious as the uh, uh, oil spills in uh, the Amazon by Texaco now, Chevron. Uh, so it's bad enough, but that's what we do all over the place and nobody pays any attention. This time it's us, so you know, it becomes a big issue. Yeah, it's bad, and uh, today uh, Obama announced uh, uh, more uh, oil drilling. Uh, it's going to renew oil drilling. Uh, so uh, the methane is no joke. You're quite right. Uh, as uh, as uh, the permafrost melts in Siberia and other places, it's going to. It's uh, the predictions are it's going to release a huge amount of tra trapped methane, which you're correct is much more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Uh, so, and a lot of other, you know, I mean, th these are kind of what are called, what are called non-linear events, you know, that you can have a sudden spurt uh, 
after things go continue slowly in a certain direction. Uh, will anything be done about it? Well, it's, it's I mean, we're facing the question of species survival in this case. It's kind of like nuclear weapons. But unfortunately, there are institutional factors that make it very hard to do anything. I mean, it's not that there are sort of bad people in control. Uh, the people who are making the decisions are trapped by institutional structures. So, for example, there's, take, I mean, the major power center in the country, unquestionably, is the corporate sector. But if you're the CEO of a corporation, uh, you don't have a lot of choices. You have to act so as to increase short-term profit or else you're out. If you don't do that, first of all, it's, re it's, it's, it's required by Anglo-American law. So if you don't do it, it's illegal. But even apart from that, if you don't do it, you're kicked out and somebody comes in and does do it. Now that's the nature of the system, you know, the semi-competitive system. Now, uh, major corporations uh, and, and business associations like the Chamber of Commerce and so on, American Petroleum Institute, they've been carrying out large-scale campaigns in the last couple of years to try to convince the public that global warming is a liberal hoax. Okay, and it's succeeding. By now, the proportion of the public who thinks that, who, who believes in anthropogenic global warming, you know, human contributions to global warming, is barely over a third. It's declined sharply. So the propaganda campaigns have been succeeding. Well, you know, the CEOs who are carrying out those campaigns understand as well as you do that this is no liberal hoax, uh, that it's going to destroy what they own and uh, destroy the lives for their grandchildren. They know that as human beings, but in their institutional role as CEOs, they have to dismiss this as what's called an externality in economic theory. As something you put aside because it doesn't have to do with uh, making the best market transactions. Well, in this case, the uh, externality happens to be the fate of the species, but it's still an institutional requirement. And to overcome that is no small task. That means really reconstructing institutional structures in a large-scale way. And the limited market, it's a very limited market that we have, uh, kind of compels uh, those uh, uh, highly destructive decisions. I mean, it's the same in financial markets. So uh, the, 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 there's what's called systemic risk. You know, if Goldman Sachs, they make some transaction, uh, if they're following, playing the, rule, the game by the rules, and they have to or else, you know, their guys are out, uh, they ignore, they, they, tr they carry out a transaction in such a way that it benefits them and if it's a risk, they, you know, insure themselves against that risk. But they don't consider the effect on the rest of the uh, financial system, what's called systemic risk. That's an externality. They ignore it. And it's built into the system that they must ignore it, even though it's understood that this is, you know, brings about repeated financial crises worse and worse. Uh, of course, that can be overcome by uh, government regulation from the Depression until the 1970s when deregulation started and financialization of the economy began. During that whole period, there were no financial crises uh, because the regulatory structure of the New Deal was sufficient to constrain it, uh, plus the whole way the financial system was organized. But since the 70s, there have been repeated crises getting worse and worse. Uh, we're likely, to, we're probably building up for the next one right now. Uh, and uh, again, this externality is not accounted for. Well, in the case of systemic risk, there's at least an answer. Uh, the government can regulate sufficiently to overcome this uh, serious market defect. In the case of uh, uh, the environment, nobody's going to do it unless God steps in. There's no one to control the externalities, uh, the fate of the species. But that's what we're faced with. So it takes real work to try to do something about this. And how much time there is, we don't know. I mean, 
what we do know is the longer we, it's delayed, the worse it's going to be. Uh, you know, how bad it'll be, you can just guess. Barack Obama promised to close Guantanamo within a year of becoming president. Um, he hasn't done so, and there doesn't seem to be any indication that he will. So I was wondering if you could address, one, whether we understand his political and legal reasons for not doing so, and whether you yourself um, see a type of solution, because it seems like the claim is that there is no solution. Well, there's a solution. You can close it. But uh, actually, the whole Guantanamo case is kind of interesting. Uh, Guantan we, what right do we have to be in Guantanamo altogether? I mean, Guantanamo was stolen from Cuba at gunpoint in 1902, the U.S. invaded Cuba to prevent it from liberating itself from Spain. In the history books here, it says we invaded to liberate them, but that's not what happened. The scholarship has wiped that out. Uh, we invaded to prevent them from liberating themselves from Spain. Uh, among other things, we, uh, at gunpoint, passed a, an amendment which required them to hand us Guantanamo, the main worked in the, you know, the eastern part of the island. And Guantan there's a treaty with Cuba that they want to get out of, but we won't let them, uh, which uh, does have conditions on the use of Guantanamo. It's supposed to be a coaling station. There's nothing in that treaty that says you can use it to uh, store uh, Haitian refugees that you don't want, as was being done for a long time. Now, there's nothing in it that says you can use it as a torture chamber. Uh, so, first of all, it stole it at gunpoint by a completely illegitimate a treaty, and it's being used in violation of that treaty. Uh, furthermore, the fact that it's a torture chamber was obvious at, at the beginning. I mean, I can't understand why anyone was surprised when the torture memos came out. I mean, why have interrogation carried out in Guantanamo instead of in a prison in New York? Well, there's only one reason. Uh, you can claim that American law doesn't apply. There's no other reason for it. So of course it was going to be a torture chamber, and it is. Now, uh, uh, it's not the only one. Uh, the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan is probably worse. Uh, and if you look at the legal record, uh, the Supreme Court did pass a decision, uh, that to make a decision that uh, overturned the Bush administration effort and claimed that, and ruled that uh, prisoners in Guantanamo have habeas corpus rights. Uh, well, that, uh, the Bush administration tried to restrict that, to say, well, it just applies to Guantanamo, not to other interrogation centers like Bagram. But the district courts, in fact, the Bush appointee in the district court uh, ruled that it applies everywhere. Okay, the Obama Justice Department is now trying to overturn that. Uh, they're trying to outflank Bush from the right on torture and uh, try to get the courts to decide that it doesn't apply to, say, Bagram, which means, as Glenn Greenwald pointed out in a blog, that what that means is that uh, if the United States captures somebody, say, in Yemen and decides it wants to torture them, they can't send them to Guantanamo to be tortured, but they can send them to Bagram. Big difference, you know. Uh, well, that's uh, Obama. You know, on the uh, uh, legal issues, it's uh, it's not a, not much of a record. There's a few things that are improvements over Bush, but not on the main ones. And this is an example. But there's no you know, there's no problem at Guantanamo. It can just be closed. Why should the United States be running torture chambers? What? Where do the detainees go if we close Guantanamo? Either you bring them to court and try them, and if they're guilty in a fair trial, sentence them, or else you free them. I'm their not, countries won't take them back. What? Their countries won't take them back, so where do you send them? If their countries don't take them back, uh, we should provide refuge for them. But um, that's what criminal trials are. I suppose you're arrested for something. You're not supposed to be tortured. You're supposed to be uh, brought to trial, and if there's a charge against you, okay, the government tries to present it, and if you're freed, you're freed. I think the whole point is that there are no charges against them. 
Well, that's the problem. They don't have uh, credible charges against them. If they did, they could bring them to trial. Uh, that's why Obama is in favor of military commissions, uh, which you know, don't have anything like the guarantees of fair trials. I mean, there's a claim, well, we're at war, and there are prisoners of war or something like that, but you know, that kind of a claim, you, anybody could make about anything. Are we out of time, sir? Is this, yes. So there are three commercials before we end. <laughs> Gnome's book is outside for sale, and it's called, um, it has an optimistic title, actually. <laughs> what is the title? Tell me the title of your book. Hopes and Prospects, that sounds good. So I think everyone should buy a copy. <laughs> um, we, ha we have two more weeks of prophecy, and please tell your friends. Uh, we're not yet sold out. We would like to be very much. Um, and uh, thanks to Peace Action for creating with us this evening and this benefit. And uh, they would like to say, and I would like to say, of course, that we should all take Peace Action uh, in our lives and do whatever we can to uh, change things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Noah.